Well, freedom of speech means you can say whatever you want. What you can't do is lie and then expect not to be accountable for it. Not all opinions are equal. The way we consume news and the way our opinions are formed is increasingly governed by the internet. My name is Alex Krasadomsky jones I'm a digital researcher at the think tank Demos. And for the last five years, we've looked at the way our lives have increasingly moved online. And it hasn't always been a smooth transition. To mark the release of the film Denial, I was asked by law firm Mishkondorea to look into how a trial that took place in 2000 has relevance today. As hundreds of millions of us turn to social media, we'll have to encounter some uncomfortable realities. What do we do when we see something we don't like or something we know to be untrue? How do we challenge it? Denial is a story about testing the truth in the face of lies. I've been lucky enough to meet some of the people from behind the film to find out how, 17 years later, many of the lessons of the trial are still relevant today. I started by visiting Anthony Julius at Mishkondorea, who played a key role in the legal team who fought the case. The obvious strategy was to produce the available evidence, which was immense at the time, and to confront Irving with that. So we would um, deploy not just witness evidence from survivors, but documentary evidence, photographs, and all the rest of it. But there were two objections to that. The first objection was it felt to me an inherently uh, uh, offensive to uh, put survivors in a position where they would be exposed to cross-examination by uh, a parade ground, barking, hectoring, anti-Semitic bully. The second objection, why would we want to put Irving in the position where he was uh, uh, given the opportunity to consider and respond to the evidence that we were offering him and then engage with us as if he was one expert in controversy with another group of experts. Why pay him the respect of that equality of approach? So we looked at the documents that he himself relied on and we found that he utterly systematically misrepresented those documents in order to produce his bogus history. We didn't need to go outside of his work. We didn't need to stand survivors in front of him. Instead, we stayed inside his castle, so to speak, and demonstrated what faulty foundations it was built on. And it finished him. But how do you capture that story and bring it to the screen? To answer that, I visited the studio of the man responsible for turning the events of the trial into a film script, Sir David Hare. What was it about the Irving Lipstadt libel case that really caught your imagination? I think I was interested in this idea that um, the two opinions would not be equal. What the 40 days of the trial proved by putting the evidence under scrutiny was that actually not all points of view are equal. Mm -hmm. That a point of view that is substantiated by fact is rather more valuable than a point of view that is not substantiated by fact. How much artistic license did that give you when you were writing the film? Well, none whatsoever. Mm -hmm. In other words, um, it seemed to me, you know, the minute I was asked to write this film, it presented particular problems. The subject of the film is verifiable truth and how truth defends itself against unsubstantiated opinion. Deborah Lipstadt had a policy of non-engagement with Holocaust deniers. So that meant that I, in representing her life, felt the same thing. I cannot go and meet David Irving. But more than that, I refuse to speculate psychologically about him. You can have opinions about the Holocaust, but I won't meet with anyone who says the Holocaust didn't happen. Professor Lipstadt, I am that David Irving. And I've got a thousand dollars to give anyone who can show me a document that proves the Holocaust. I will not debate you, not here, not now, not because ever. Because you can't. James Libson is a partner at Mishkondorea, who was also involved in the case. He told us why this story is still relevant today. When you heard that a Hollywood film was potentially being made, what was your first reaction? I didn't take it all that seriously. I didn't think it would happen. Only when we uh, started sitting down with David Hare and someone of his stature had been commissioned to actually write a script did it feel uh, realistic. 
I read an article, one of your initial reactions when you heard that the film was potentially being commissioned was, what's the point? At the time, uh, and until recently, I thought it was done and dusted, and I didn't think the story needed to be told uh, in 2016-17. Has your opinion changed? My opinion has changed, actually. The first reason it's changed is when uh, I first saw the online reaction to the trailer, was almost universally and exclusively virulently anti-Semitic, very hateful, very supportive of uh, denial and uh, Irving and the line that he had taken. And it felt as if that, that lurking under the surface uh, is a sentiment uh, that I had thought maybe we had dealt with, but we clearly haven't dealt with. And the second reason is that the film is a passionate plea for truth and the importance of truth. And what we've seen recently in the post-truth society, in this vile phrase of uh, post-truth in common circulation, is a worrying phenomenon. And so I think a film that stands for truth and the way in which uh, you establish truth is a good thing nowadays. You don't need to protect me. No, we're not, we're not protecting you, we're protecting our case. Our strategy is to keep the focus on Irving and Irving alone. It's not a test of your credibility, it's a test of his. Deborah Lipstadt, the historian at the centre of the libel case in 2000, shared how the issues in the case impact upon us in 2017. One of the things that makes fake news and post-truth possible is, of course, the internet. 16, 17, certainly 20, 30 years ago and more than that, People with outlandish conspiracy, conspiratorial ideas, they were separated from one another. Maybe one found another, but it wasn't so easy. Uh, today it's much easier because of the internet. Uh, but I don't want to make this a beat up on the internet kind of thing because in my research, in my work, in my writing, I depend on the internet. But with every privilege comes responsibility. Just because you read it on the internet doesn't make it true. We have to be willing to make pains of ourselves, you know, to, to be really annoying and demand a higher level of proof. Previously, what one would say uh, in reaction to what one heard on the TV or the radio uh, that you would say in the privacy of your own home, people now put immediately on the internet and it's circulated very quickly, and that's all through the facility of, uh, of social media. So for all of the, the good uh, that social media and the internet can, uh, can achieve, that is the price that we are uh, paying for it. And sometimes uh, it feels as if the price uh, comes very high. One person who knows this price all too well is Stella Creasy, the MP for Walthamstow. During a campaign to put Jane Austen on the £10 note, she was subjected to death and rape threats online. I caught up with her and asked her what lessons the film might have for us in 2017. What I think is interesting now and where I think denial particularly fits into these kind of discussions is about this concept of what is a fact and people's ability to find facts and to find in the bigger echo chambers that they're living in now counterfact to prove that they were right all along. So we have a society where people are ever more engaged in debate and discussion but actually perhaps ever less critical of where information is coming from because there's so much of it about. But I draw a line between speech which is designed to be expressing an opinion that I have and speech which is designed to evoke a reaction in somebody, particularly a reaction of fear and distress. Would you lay that at the door of the social media platforms? Would you say that they are they're part of the, the problem in this? Or? I would say it's a problem for all of us. I'd say it's actually about all of us recognising that we have to have a different type of debate. So we do need a different type of public sphere in which people take responsibility themselves for the kind of debates, the discussions that we're having at a local micro grassroots level and indeed at an international level. Fiaz Mogal, Director of Faith Matters and Tell Mama, has monitored the rise of Islamophobia online and has urged for it to be taken much more seriously. Social media has become really an amplification tool for these extreme, sometimes extreme, sometimes bigoted groups who effectively want to get their message across. There's also a heightened sense of aggression. There's a heightened sense of people saying what they want to say, which they wouldn't say in real life. And I think as part of that process, it's been a tool by which haters, whether anti-Muslim haters or anti-Semitic haters, for example, have used it as a platform to promote and amplify their hatred. In the report that you put to the Select Committee when asked about this, you were critical about what social media companies were doing in terms of keeping this content off the internet or at least reducing its volume. What more do you think that they could be doing? 
they need to be acting faster on accounts that are clearly extreme in nature and promoting hatred over a period of time. We are looking at long-term accounts which are running for one, two, three, four years that have been promoting anti-Muslim hatred that are still up and running. With billions of messages being sent by hundreds of millions of users every day, the big social media companies are facing an unprecedented challenge. Richard Taylor is a technology correspondent based in Silicon Valley. Thankfully, the major tech firms are beginning to show signs of dealing with it very decisively. Twitter is taking it seriously. I think they've realised that it is something that affects not just individual users, but of course it has enormous reputational implications as well. And we are seeing now finally a new policy rolling out which makes it much easier for users to flag abusive content, to block users, uh, to report offensive tweets. They recognise it's a problem, they recognise they can't simply sit back and, and say that they're a dumb vehicle or a dumb platform where content can simply uh, roam free, that they actually have to take concrete measures to make sure that this doesn't happen in future. It seems as if the social media companies are catching up, but what about the justice system? Are we doing enough to provide the same protection online as we'd expect offline? To find out, I spoke to Nazir Afzal, Chief Executive of the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners. Facebook and Twitter, as I understand it, signed up to a code of conduct last year, uh, which was aimed at sharing more information with each other and with the police to be able to, be able to identify people who are constantly abusing and, and threatening and, and committing crimes online. Policing the internet is the same as policing the street, it's just a different environment and there needs to be greater training, there needs to be greater understanding of what people can do and what they can't do and more cooperation and communication and ultimately it can be policed in the same way that you can police the street. In 2017, post-Trump, uh, post-Brexit, uh, conspiracy theories uh, everywhere all the time, uh, it's absolutely essential that we hold dearest to our hearts the truth uh, and that we ensure that the truth wins out and uh, the legal system is here to try and ensure that uh, and if you know I absolutely pay tribute to everybody that was involved in the Irving trial because it set out a benchmark really uh, for how it is that we should be dealing with those who would try and deny the truth. It's often said that we live in an information age though that may now be an understatement we are under a barrage of news, articles, think pieces, memes, infographics, arguments and counterarguments, facts and counterfacts, out of which we must try to pull together some sense of the world. But within this, it's vital that people are able to identify truth from lies, signal from noise, fact from fiction, and perhaps most importantly, to care about the difference. We've always been entitled to our opinion, but now we all have the capability to share it. It's up to us to decide which of those opinions are worth more than others. What was the experience of seeing somebody else play you on the big screen? Well, it was really quite demoralizing because I, I, I appreciated within minutes that, that Andrew Scott is, is, is a better Anthony Julius than I am. <laughs> What did you make of Jack Loudon? Happy? I'm very happy with Jack Loudon. <laughs> Handsome, thin, that's all I wanted. I can prove to you that Elvis is running a bakery in West Bromwich because I've seen a picture on the internet. 